Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Jason Howard. He is medical digital lead at Sanofi, and we discuss the importance of social media monitoring and social listening for MSLs. Great chat. You guys are going to love it. Um, don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn and look for the announcements about the MSL Talk live events, which are typically the first Tuesday of every month at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. And thank you guys for all your support. Welcome to MSL Talk with Tom Caravella, a podcast specifically designed for MSLs and all things field medical. Hey, Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Awesome, man. I'm excited. This is going to be a great conversation. So, you know, guys, I like to always give you the backstory. So ran into Jason at the MSL Society meeting um, and he did this talk. It was really awesome. So we started to um, talk about the idea of maybe bringing similar conversation out to you guys. And here we are. So Jason, why don't you do a quick introduction and tell everybody who you are, where you're from and all that good stuff. Sure. So Jason Howard, Scientific Engagement and Medical Digital Lead uh, with Sanofi Specialty Care. So we are in a global operations role. Uh, supporting all our regions and all our therapeutic areas from a digital perspective. Awesome. Awesome. And as we get started, we do have a, a, a sponsor for this episode is actually sponsored by the Aspire MSL program, which is, um, if you guys haven't heard of it yet, it's for MSL, aspiring MSLs looking to break into their first role. Um, Sarah Snyder and I developed a coaching program. It's basically an on online course, step-by-step -step guide. If you want more information on how to break into your first MSL role, go to mslmastery.com. Um, we'd love to have you join us. So let's jump into this. The first thing that I think I have to ask you is what is a medical digital lead? That sounds like kind of a new title or um, just tell us what that's all about. Sure, yeah, I would say it is fairly new and you're seeing similar roles cropping up in a lot of different pharma companies. We are all going through a time of digital transformation right now. A lot of companies in pharma are looking to enable omni-channel engagement, right? And traditionally, that is within the role of commercial. I think our commercial colleagues have been in that space for a long time. We're discussing it in medical now. And so we need the skills and we need the headcount and we need the teams to be able to medicalize that approach. And so medical digital leads are, are taking that mantle up and, and attempting to bring that type of engagement, that integrated personalized engagement strategy to the medical side of the business. And so that's that's the focus of my team. Yeah, well, you're in a hot spot, man, obviously. I would say so. <laughs> Because any conference you go to or anything that you see when you're following the medical affairs world, obviously, it's all about omnichannel, it's all about digital, it's all about AI. And I think the world is trying to either catch up or at least stay on pace or figure out what is going to be the best strategy for them as it relates to all of those technologies, tools, and, um, you know, and, and, and new kind of paradigms, because I think we're in this like paradigm shift. So, um, I know one of the things you and I talked about, and one of the things that you had presented at the conference was this concept of social media monitoring. Yeah. Um, also known as social listening. So let's talk about that. And if you could just tell us what that is. Yeah. So um, it is part of our omni channel strategy, obviously, because you can't have omni channel without analytics and without engagement. And social media monitoring provides both. Right. So it is an opportunity to get new sources of insights in real time. And the real key to that is what? So what are the insights? What are the discussions and who? Who's having them? Who is connected around these conversations? And so it's a really great one two punch to be able to get those new sources of insights in real time, but also expand your network and understand who is having those conversations about what. And that's it's really, really important from that perspective. Yeah, you kind of look under the hood, right? You get more details and you're learning more. And for those of you who are interested in Omnichannel, because let me take a step back a little bit, because we're talking about Omnichannel. There might be people listening to this that don't know what Omnichannel is. Yeah, sure. So, right content, right place, right time, right? So being able to personalize your content and engagement in an N of one way, that's sort of the fastest way to talk about it. Right. So it's personalizing the content. So yeah. 
the reason social listening and social media monitoring is so important is you can't personalize if you don't know what the information is, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you start with this social media monitoring and then what happens next? One, like, where do you go? And, and like, where's like the, the next step in that process? Yeah, it's connecting the insights and connecting the engagement to strategy, right? So one way of looking at it is if you think about the normal cadence of an MSL team, you have a conference. Mm -hmm. You'll meet with a lot of people there. Sometimes your KOLs are not there, right? So you catch up with them over the next couple months. And then over those next few months, you have your one-on-one -on -one engagements. Ideally, you're putting your insights into a CRM. And now this, you know, this, this gold, this medical gold is starting to trickle into your strategy. Within social media, what we've seen is that the relevant conversations around your Congress, the relevant conversations around your FDA launch, your relevant conversations around your new publication, that happens within 48 hours. So we can really shorten the time scale. And we've looked and checked to make sure that those conversations aren't just rosy statements that KOLs are making in public because they know they're being watched. Is this being, is this representative of those conversations you have in your one-on-one -on -one engagements, your private one-on-one -on -one engagements moving forward? And we've seen a lot of correlation, which is really great. Social media in some ways is the ultimate peer review. So people are hesitant to go online and put their credibility, put their reputation on the line and say something that may not be entirely accurate. So we have seen in our hands that if a KOL says something online, uh, it's very substantive and it should be taken very seriously. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I imagine compliance is a big issue. Big issue. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the biggest issues that we have, and if I could give some people some recommendations if they're interested in doing this, number one, check with your company's compliance about personal social media use. Every company has one, so feel free to dive in and get comfortable with that before you dip your toe into the social media monitoring waters and utilizing that information to get uh, enhanced engagement. And then the other one is PV, right? Pharmacovigilance. If you see something, say something. Um, you can adjust which topics you're monitoring and which people you're monitoring and which platforms you're monitoring to limit your pharmacovigilance risk, right? Um, we all know that if you're looking at Reddit, that's a lot more patient to patient conversations. So your, your odds of getting pharmacovigilance issues go up. Med Twitter on Twitter is surprisingly clean from a pharmacovigilance perspective because the HCPs know what they should and shouldn't say publicly. So we've had very few issues um, when they've arisen and when they do arise, uh, we report them for uncle vigilance so uh you know it's it's pretty clean and you you started to answer the next question i had as i'm curious as to what are the some of the main channels that you're monitoring social media channels is it twitter is it linkedin is, yeah. it, is there a facebook that fits into this or is it really just so are we know? are we calling it x now are, are we going to make the next are we making the leap are we calling is it, it x it is. I, I say X. Twitter only because it's still Twitter to me, but it is X now, correct? I, I, I still I still say Twitter. I yeah. saw a poll recently where 90% of people are still calling it Twitter. Um, but I feel like, you know, we're that'll be changing soon. But whatever you want to call it, Twitter X is still yeah. king. It's still yeah. king for HCP engagement, HCP discussion of science. Um, we haven't seen any metrics to tell us otherwise. You know, um, it's very interesting. We were monitoring sort of the volumes on these different platforms. Pre-pandemic, the volume on Twitter was actually dropping off quite a bit. Um, and it exploded during the pandemic for obvious reasons, right? Everyone was stuck at home. Everyone was looking for the latest real-time information and Twitter was a perfect source for that. And HCPs were connecting with each other, trying to find out What's going on? What do I do? How do I, right? And it was a very, very powerful tool for that. And we've seen in our hands that the numbers say the engagement levels have not really uh, dropped off since the handover of the platform and uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So there's still a lot of engagement there and we haven't really seen HCPs moving en masse to another platform. Um, the only other one, I would say the major one is LinkedIn. What I would caution people, though, is that people tend to want to discuss science on Twitter and X. They want to network on LinkedIn. So be respectful of the differences in the cultures. 
Um, and then beyond that, you can find disease state specific. So not so much Facebook, but definitely Instagram. I've heard some discussions of TikTok. Um, TikTok and Instagram are really good for those disease states that have visual components. Dermatology is a great example where there are strong discussion of dermatology on on Instagram because it's a visual disease and, and, and TikTok as well. So you may find that there are different pockets of different platforms that are specific to your disease state, but Twitter X, whatever you want to call it these days is still number one. That's the number one. What about YouTube? Like I would think YouTube would be a place. I, I mean, I would imagine yeah. you could all of them, but. There are definitely KOLs on YouTube. There are definitely um, HCPs on YouTube. Um, the difficulty is the monitoring. So being able to do it in a coordinated way to get the monitoring of a video, you have to go from like video to text. And um, so it's not, you can definitely find them and monitor for your own, but from the perspective of a coordinated social media listening strategy, uh, YouTube can be tricky from that perspective, but you can still find videos. You can still find your HCPs. You can still find them and then be able to summarize them in your own time. Got you. Okay, so we're I think we're we're getting this figured out, right? And 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 it this makes complete sense. But I'm just curious as to why is social listening so important right now? Yeah, for us, it's four buckets of main value, right? It's the real time insights. It's new sources of insights. It's digital. And we haven't really talked about this concept yet. Digital opinion leader identification, right? digital opinion leader as opposed to key opinion leader, right? And sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. And so you have to get into this sphere and find out uh, who they are. And then utilizing all that information between the insights and who is having those conversations to increase your team's KOL access. So being able to put all that together um, in a real time way has been really powerful for our medical teams. So you, you, when you say powerful, you, you do all this stuff, you pull this together. And so how effective is it? Like, are there, are there like statistics? Do you track it? Are there metrics that you look at after you do these? I don't know if they're called campaigns or if it's just programs. You can definitely call campaigns when you're talking about proactive DOL engagement. So I would say for sure we're you know, I know we're not comfortable with that concept or term of campaign within medical because it feels very, uh, you know, marketing. But we're that's definitely a place that we're we're heading for sure. Um, we need longer term engagement with this to start measuring how we're impacting across our therapeutic areas, and we're working on ways to do that. But I can tell you just anecdotally firsthand, the people, the MSLs that I talk to gain a lot of value from following their own KOLs and being able to get their access in my own hands. Uh, uh, something that I used to do, and I recommend everyone do this, is I would monitor the Congresses. When I was in the field, I was an oncology MSL. I would monitor the Congresses in real time. We we're always wondering, hey, who's here, right? We, if, we, sometimes you'll reach out to your team. Could you send me a list of the of your KOLs or your HCPs that are at this regional meeting? And that never works. And it's always awkward. And someone, you know, it takes forever to put that list together. Why not meet the people who are becoming social at the event that you're at? So mm -hmm. monitor in real time. See who's talking about the data. See who's taking pictures of the posters. You'll find who they are just by monitoring. So what I would do is I would see who is talking about the conference at the Congress look up their email addresses, reach out and say, hey, I'm at this meeting, you're at this meeting. I thought you said some really interesting things about X, Y, and Z, whatever the topic was. I would love to meet and get your experience as a digital opinion leader. And I usually got the meeting about 75% of the time. You're targeting the people who are putting themselves out there to be social. They want to be contacted. So it works out for everybody. You get that new source of insights. If they're not in your territory, you can do a warm handoff to another to another team, you know, to another uh, MSL on your team. And so it really helps build that community in a really real time way. And so it, it was very, very successful. Well, I mean, it, it, it sounds brilliant. I mean, this all sounds great. It's it's effective. You're you're gaining all these insights, developing relationships. You're staying ahead of the curve. So that now I'm sitting here and I'm saying, OK, well, what's what are the pitfalls? What are the words of caution that we need? to maybe get out there to MSLs and to companies that are adopting these sorts of, of, of you know, tactics? 
I'll go back to the first one about compliance. I, I think it's really important to talk about um, and in a very specific way. So we should never be conversing with HCPs on these public platforms in the public sphere, right? Um, certainly not responding. If, if Dr. So-and-so says, I think this data is terrible and here's why, and you have evidence to suggest otherwise, that's not the place to have that conversation, right? Now, you can feel free to reach out personally through a direct message, through an email and say, hey, I saw what you said online. I'd love to talk about it further, blah, 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 blah. Have a scientific engagement, have a scientific discussion about that. But we really have to, you know, temper ourselves and say, that's not the place to have the conversation in public. And I would say that's the biggest one for sure. I mean, that's good advice. Yeah, for sure. So how relevant is this now versus like five years ago? You know, was it a thing five years ago? So I gave the same talk this year at the MSL Society that I gave four years ago. Same topic. Mm, Change okay. the same. And four years ago, I asked the room, took sort of a Vox Populi poll. I said, raise your hand if you currently follow your HCPs or KOLs online. And about a third of the room raised their hands. I said, okay, now raise your hand if your team has a coordinated social media monitoring strategy in place. And maybe three people out of the 50 who were there uh, raised their hand. Okay, so I wanted to see how that compared over the course of the next four years, particularly with the pandemic. And I said the same question, who's following their KOLs? This time, every single person in the room raised their hand. I said, all right, that's, that's the growth I was expecting to see based on what we saw. And then the next question, who has a coordinated social media monitoring strategy? And again, only about three out of 50 people raised their hand. So I think there's a real opportunity here for medical affairs teams to bridge that gap. You're getting that value of the teams following their KOLs, have that value bubble up into your strategy with a coordinated approach. And so I, it, I was a little bit surprised to see that disconnect, but it's great to see that the opportunity is still there. And at least at a minimum, the field teams have latched onto it and they're using it personally. Yeah. And, and when it comes to using it, um, I know from speaking to MSLs and having these conversations that it's become really effective with access. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. How important it is to, to, to use this as a means of getting insights, learning about the KOLs and figuring out how you can gain access. You know, one of the most difficult things about being an MSL is that initial meeting, building that relationship, right? You have, it's always that horrible balance of how much soft skill relationship building do I do before I dive into some science? Or is that going to be a waste of time? Does this KOL want to just get into the conversation, but I don't really know them. So how do we build a relationship? Coming to the table with topics that you know they've discussed in public is a really great way to dive in. You can almost skip a lot of the get to know you stuff because you've already demonstrated you've done the homework. I know you. I know what you're interested in. Let's get into the real meat of the discussion. And it's worked out really, really well. So that's how I've utilized it. That's how I recommend um, MSLs in our company utilize it as well. You can get right to that substantive conversation and dive into insights discussions um, in a really meaningful way. A lot of that soft skill discussion that you have to build that relationship is just to let them know the HCP or KOL has been heard. By coming to the table with their tweets, You've already demonstrated that they've they've been heard, and so you can dive right in. So it's it's yeah. been it's it's really great for both sides, to be honest with you. Yeah, and this is going to get easier because I think, and from the conversations that I've had with people that are experts in artificial intelligence, there's going to there already is, but I think it's going to be even more elaborate. Is there's there is going to be artificial intelligence listening programs that are going to go out there, and they're going to compile data from KOLs and put it into whether it's CRM or some other type of program so that the MSL or somebody in medical affairs can just go and actually, instead of actually going out and finding the information, it's going to come to you. Have you seen yeah. that? We're starting to see glimpses of that, right? So we already had natural language processing capability to aggregate the data. 
right? Mm-hmm. So we've been we've been doing that for four or five years, right? And we've seen iterative improvement over the years as it's gotten better and better and better as far as being able to dial you in on that medically relevant conversation. So you're not scrolling through thousands and thousands of posts. It's impossible. You know, when I was on the oncology team, uh, lung, imagine lung cancer, trying to find through lung, just lung cancer alone. Oncology is the most engaged subspecialty of medicine online. It's impossible for someone to be able to aggregate that information in a coordinated way. Now, one-on-one, if you want to take away a learning as you're an MSL and a, you know, on a one-on-one level, you can follow your KOLs. You can see what they're saying and get your own value. That's great. But if we're talking about a coordinated strategy, it's basically impossible without NLP at at its beginning. Okay. Mm. Then the next step is, can we get AI to then analyze within that, right? So we're taking these iterative steps to do the most boring grunt work part of this, right? That's what we want. Get rid of the grunt work and focus on the strategy. Get us as close, as quickly to the strategy as we can. Don't get, you know, there's a lot of discussion around replacement of jobs or replacement of function with AI. Don't get replaced, get supercharged right? Mm-hmm. Use these tools to take out the worst part or the most grunt part, grunt work part of your job so you can get right to the strategy. Because what our value is, is being able to take that ocean, boil it down to that bucket, and then tell the company what that bucket means, right? And we can use technology to boil it down very, very quickly. And then our value is translating that information to strategy. And we, that's still our job. And yeah. I, I really enjoy getting to that decision point a lot faster. I mean, I have to imagine there's a lot of MSLs listening to this conversation. They're like, yeah, okay, guys, you know, this this sounds great. So on top of everything else I have to do, I now have to listen to all of my KOLs on all these different different social media platforms to glean information that's going to help me. So, and and yeah, the answer is yes, but Um, you know, there's going to be times when maybe you're just too busy and you can't do it. So I think that the AI tools that are coming and and the stuff that you're talking about, um, I think is going to be a real good asset to be able to provide that extra information that will give the MSLs the advantage, knowledge, and information that they need when they go out into into their meetings or just to be able to have more relevant information on that KOL that they may not have had before without having to listen to every conversation. So, yeah, and I'll add to that. That's where your team comes in handy, right? Because when we were doing this within a given team, um, there are different levels of maturity within the team. So we start the program and then there's a handful of people who want to dive in. They want to use the platforms. They want to get hands on with the data. They want to really help you know monitor and report these insights. And that's great. There's other people who said, you know, I'm really just interested in what my KOLs do and my DOLs do online. I'll just follow them personally and see what's going on. And then we had another group of people who said, I'm not interested in social media. I'm not interested in monitoring. And I'm not interested in these platforms whatsoever. But I'd love to see the report. Let me know what's going on. Keep me in the loop as to what's going on. And that's how you can, you know, divvy it up as a team. So everyone is engaged at the level that they want to be, but everyone's getting the information they need. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, things are moving so fast. I mean, even in the last six months, like this year, things are just totally evolving. So where do you, what's next? Like, where are we going? Like, where do we go? Yeah. You know, I get asked this question a lot and certainly as the digital or social guy, we feel the speed of change. I, it's impossible. It's almost impossible to keep track at the rate of change. I get asked, you know, oh, have you heard of Bing Bong? Have you seen Bing Bong? I'm like, I don't even know what that, you know, it's, I, I get a new platform thrown at me every week. I don't even know if they're real. Um, so it's, it's hard to keep track of that. I think we all have to agree that summative, that generative AI and chat GPT is a game changer. Mm-hmm. Um, is that technology, is something, is chat GPT the answer? I don't know but I guarantee you the answer is gonna look a lot like it, right? It may not be the answer, but the the answer that we have over the next two, three, four, five years will look a lot like that. And so I would say get engaged and be supercharged, right? That's my advice, get engaged and be supercharged because this is all coming. And particularly in a medical function, right? We are very, very, very digitally savvy at a baseline, at a maturity baseline. So embrace it, 
right? Embrace this, these new tools, embrace this opportunity to do the worst part of your jobs as quickly as possible. So you can then be engaged on strategy, be engaged in relationship development, be engaged in those parts of being an MSL that are the fun parts, that are the really exciting parts and where we provide our value. Because I, I have a hard time seeing that being automated, right? So getting that, getting those insights down to something that's manageable, getting those reports out, getting ad boards summarized, things like that. Let's leave that to the AI so we can then translate that information into strategy and value for our companies. And that I think that's where the real excitement is. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I think you hit the then on had used the word embrace. If yeah. you're not embracing this stuff, I just think that you're going to get left behind. I, I do. I, I think that all of us, I think that we all have to realize that this stuff is going to happen whether we like it or not. And, and if we can embrace it and try to figure out how it can help us in our jobs, I think a lot of people are afraid of AI, like you said, it's going to replace jobs and whatever else. But like, I, I think that for the most part, it's going to enhance most of our jobs yeah. and make things easier for us. But that means we have to embrace the use of some of these tools, learn it, not just ignore it. Because I know a lot of people are like, ah, you know what? I can't be bothered. I can't learn another thing. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, am I, I right about that or am I just getting crazy? I heard a great analogy recently. And I think I, I, I really like thinking about it this way. Um, imagine what painters thought when cameras came out, right? Wow, you're cheating. You what? So what? You just point a machine at your subject and you hit a button, that's cheating. I'm an artist, right? I'm a painter. And the great thing is fast forward 100, 150 years, we still have painters we, and, and we understand that there's an art associated with photography, right? Um, no one will deny that photography is an art. Why? Because people learned how to utilize that combination of technology and intuition to create something new. And I think we're headed in that same direction. That's my hope. All right, man. Let's go. Let's get there. <laughs> Jason, thanks for coming on, man. You were awesome. This is a great conversation and you're welcome back anytime. Oh, thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. That's the show, guys. Thanks for all your support. Don't forget to share this with your friends and, um, and get it out there because I think this is a great conversation. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the show. And if you enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you don't miss an episode in the future and feel free to leave a rating or a review or a comment. Thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you soon.